This is going to be a film study about Marlon Humphrey's 2022 season with the Baltimore Ravens. I think he really returned to form, played at an extremely high level in 2022 compared to his his 2021 performance. Uh, just vastly different level, if you ask me, over the course of 17, 18 games in in the coverage, the way the tightness of his coverage, whether it was man or zone, the physicality returned, making plays. Um, that's where we'll start this video here in a moment. But if you're wondering about the title "Pure Blood," it's a reference to, you know, his father, Mar uh, uh, Bobby Humphrey. Marlon's father was a elite player at Alabama. Had some success in the NFL. Injuries, <clears throat> situation with the Broncos, you know, didn't work out. His career ended up being a little shorter than his talent level. You know, than you would have surmised. His his mother was a track athlete, I think, at Alabama, and, and Marlon, you know, stayed at home at Hoover High School in Alabama, stayed at home for college as well. So there's a there's a level of expectation that I'm sure is there. Never heard him speak on it, but there it has to be a high level of expectation when your family has that much success. Look, that's where we're going to start this video in terms of making plays. I'm going to harken back and reference a little bit to uh, previous seasons. To be honest with you, I think we were spoiled. Uh, Ravens fans, we were spoiled by um, the level of play that Marlon showed early in his career, with all the turnovers he caused, with all the, it was an obscene amount of forced fumbles, fumble recoveries, interceptions, pick sixes. We were, we, it, it normalized us to the behavior and the performance, meaning we thought that that was just natural, that those things would happen. They're not natural. There's no way for things like this to happen this often. 2020, eight forced fumbles, led the league that's insane for an edge rusher or a D tackle or a linebacker, let alone a corner nickel hybrid. Those numbers, eight force fumbles, that's off the charts and just not something that can be replicated, in my opinion. Go back one year before that, 2019, three interceptions, three force fumbles, and two defensive touchdowns. Here's one of them. This is, you know, all, let me show you four old plays of, of him making plays, turnovers. He was Pro Bowl both of those years, 2019 and 2020. I think 19, he was he was voted All Pro. It's very difficult to be voted All Pro with how many good, great corners I should say there are. Both of those years, you know, prior to that, 17 and 18, demonstrated great coverage, physical play against the run, physical play against DBs, you know, physical play um, against anyone that, that tried to block him. I really don't need to, shouldn't need to convince you of that. Uh, this is an interception that's tipped by Calais Campbell on a zone drop here. And Marlon's just in the right place in terms of the, the deflected pass coming right to him. You know, playmaker. So we were spoiled, in my opinion. We were spoiled. We thought that those things, a lot of us thought that, you know, those things would just happen all the time. 2021, we didn't see that hardly at all. We And, and we saw reduced effectiveness in terms of coverage skills. Terms of well, you know, even week one against the Raiders in 2021, he gave up two big catches to Brian Edwards that you know put them in position. Them being the Raiders, put them in position to, you know, go ahead and force overtime. Whereas if we get the the stop, the game's over. Another interception off a deflection. Um, these things are not random. It's just great defensive play. The previous play I showed you by Calais Campbell, this one by Josh Bynes. Ball could have been picked off by him. It's deflected and Mar goes right to Marvin Humphrey. Being in the right place at the right time, whether it's zone or man, putting yourself in position to make plays, that's what he did. And it just so happened that a high percentage of those things fell in his hands or fumbles that he recovered and took to the house. <clears throat> 2022, we did see a little bit of that. Don't get me wrong. This year, and we're going to get to this year's film in a moment, just letting you see four plays of the type of the quality of turnovers that he forced, the types of plays he was involved in that really spoiled us. 2022 film, all right? Now, statistically, he did give us some of that this year. Three interceptions, two forced fumbles, excuse me, two fumble recoveries. Here's one of the interceptions against Buffalo in week four. He's trying to take it to the house. And three sacks this year used as a blitzer. Normally uh, used as a blitzer when he's lined up as the, the nickel corner, the slot corner, wh whatever you want to call it. Here he is, man to man, up here against uh, Demonte Parker. Interception late fourth quarter, I think, here against the Patriots. Patriots had a chance, I think, to take the lead here. Maybe tie. Marlon comes up with a big play. I think I'll give you the end zone angle of this one too. It's going to be left side of your screen. He only had seven passes defensed in 2022, and there are some who would offer their own reasons why. I don't. I know why, and I think a lot of you do too. If you're 
the types of per type of person who f tunes in to watch this with my channel or with anyone else's channel that does film study, film study, you know why. M Marlon was avoided for large stretches of 2022. It just was. Like I'll I'm going to show you plays here in a moment of him in great coverage relationship. This is going to be a long video. You're looking at about probably 35 minutes. And it's all going to be about Marlon Humphrey. I'm trying to make it comprehensive, trying to do this with one player each week. I'm obviously really late on this one being a Saturday live stream, which is the intention, you know, to be honest with you. People avoided him for large stretches of the season. And when I sh and I'll show, I'm going to show you some plays where he's not targeted and, and he's in coverage. He doesn't get the sack here. I think JPP cleans this thing up. I don't think he gave up a touchdown this year in 2022, to my knowledge. Definitely not in man. You guys are, who ha who subscribe to like you know PFF or other you know rating services, you can let me know what they say. I did see one statistic whereby he was credited with allowing 46 catches this year in 17 games. First of all, I don't think that's a very high number at all. Second of all, I'm not sure about that. I'm not, but I don't keep track of how many. You know, receptions he allowed. I don't know the coverage. In certain cases, you can tell that it's man. You can tell, you know, here that he's not guarding the man that fumbles the football. It's forced by Marcus Peters. Really should have been a defensive touchdown if they don't blow it dead. You can see Marlon's got a clear path to the end zone. Would have been a big play. He just wasn't targeted a whole lot, you know. And and if you disagree with that, if you think he was targeted a lot, you know, I know that he was not because I I watch the game and I track it. And then I try to make as many highlight videos as possible because I want people to watch. I want people to watch my channel. And Marlon Humphrey videos, Kyle Hamilton videos, Marcus Williams videos, they draw views. So people are going to um, offer you that content. This is a great job. Kind of like a little China out, whip route. I think 12 is, you saw him a moment ago glance at Marlon. So he's bringing this in. And then for whatever reason, bringing it back out and Marlon just jumps it. There are some who say he doesn't have great ball skills. Maybe he doesn't have great ball skills. But he's got good enough ball skills to make a lot of interceptions. He had three this year in not many targets, as I said. And I understand why people avoided him because the coverage was so good. Like I said, he didn't give up a TD and a touchdown. And man, I do think there was a play against the Giants in the red zone late in that week six loss where he's not the primary reason for the touchdown being allowed down there. But I think he could play it a whole lot better. And I'm holding him to a high standard because I think he warrants that. His play um, over the course of his career and this year warrants us to hold him to a high standard. I think there's even been a couple of interviews with Marlon where he talks about, um, you know, he messed up or that guy beat me. Uh, the, for those of you that don't know, George Pickens for the Steelers is also from Hoover High in Alabama. And when they played each other in week 14, I thought he did a great job. George Pickens against Marlon Humphrey. I think he had two catches directly on Marlon, maybe a third he only had three catches in the game, though. I don't think they were all on Marlon. But point is, Marlon readily admitted, like, two weeks later, hey, he got the better of me. He, he went, came right out and said it. I think he holds himself to a high standard, and we do too. But the standard of the turnovers forced, the interceptions, the fumbles recovered and, recovered and turned, returned for a touchdown is just too damn high. It was just too damn high leading into 2021 where we didn't get hardly any of that. Return to form in 2022, in my opinion. Like I said, I don't subscribe to a lot of the rating services uh, for, for various reasons. I don't think I need to, for real, to be honest with you, because I do this and I try to show you as much film as possible. Um, and, and generally, the, the film, I hope, is aligning with what I'm saying. I'm going to show you guys his coverage now. We're going to talk about generally man to start. I'm loading that up right now. we got 11 plays here. The one thing I want to mention is he played the best against, I thought, the Bills and the Bengals. I thought that that was the situations where he played exceptional. And I don't really need anyone to explain to me you know, how well he played because the film shows it. Up top, I think against Diggs, it's a third, it's an important third down. And the, the types of routes that are one break routes, you know, an in-breaking route, an out-breaking route, he doesn't have trouble with at all. I mean, I don't see it. The types of routes that I felt like he has trouble with is over routes. And I'm going to show you about six examples of that later on as Geno Stone getting beat by the tight end on what I thought, actually it's the second down. I thought it was a, a third down. And here at the bottom, think against Gabe Davis. Man, some of this you're just going to be able to watch for yourself. You know, absent really my commentary, you don't need me to tell you when he's in good coverage relationship. You can see it yourself. 
against the Bengals and Chase. I think this one's against Boyd. Thought he played super against those guys in almost every iteration. Against Chase down here at the bottom side of the screen. There's going to be examples of, you know, big plays that I showed you earlier. Um, and and most of this here, for, sorry, I was flipping through some pages. Most of this here is going to be examples of him just in good coverage relationship, whether he's targeted or not. Great effort by Daryl Worley up top against, um, I think that's Hayden Hurst on like a little end cut. But this situation here is one that coming into 2022, I thought was important for Marlon and for the Ravens. Did Jamar Chase um, have some catches against the Ravens this year? Sure. Did he make a couple against Marlon Humphrey? He sure did. Nowhere near the type of production that he had in 2021, just in the one week seven game where the Bengals came in there and scored uh, 40, 41 points. I think for this, for the season in three games, he had 24 catches on 37 targets. So a little bit less than 66% catch percentage. That's not that bad, but it's the yards per catch that was extremely low for a guy like Jamar Chase with his talent level. This is him and man against um, Chris Olave up top. Great coverage. In this game against the Saints, Saints, when Olave was lined up against certain guys, particularly in the slot, it was kind of easy for him to get open. Two situations where we put Marlon on him for whatever reason, either he traveled with him or it was outside corner, and Marlon just basically took him out of the game on that particular play. Three guys I thought had the biggest plays against Marlon uh, this year, 2022, and I'm going to name them here, and we'll see a little bit of it on film. It's the bigger, taller, 6'4 receivers like Mike Evans, who had a few vertical routes caught against Marlon in Week 8. George Pickens had at least two catches in the Ravens-Steelers' first matchup in Week 14. Drake London had an exceptional game in Baltimore. Seven catches. I think two or three of them was directly on Marlon Humphrey. Uh, I think it's the bigger, taller, 6'4", 6'5", guys who gave him some issues this year. It wasn't the smaller guys like a DJ Moore or even Jamar Chase. I love this play, even though he's, you know, his hips end up turning twice. You can see his hips turn to the inside. He's very physical and aggressive with his hands. I just love the turn. That's not exactly the way you want everyone to play it. But his athletic ability, how do I say this? 2021, he didn't look as athletic. He didn't look as smooth. This year, I thought looked super athletic. And when I talk about athletic, I mean guys who can be athletic through contact. When they've initiated contact or when someone has initiated contact on them, they maintain their athleticism, their ability to move quick. Point is, I don't think he had trouble with the smaller, quick, wide receivers, which has been one of the notions talked about with Marlon you know, for a couple of years. He had trouble with the bigger guys. He certainly didn't have trouble in the slot. And, and I think those three games that I referenced, the first Steelers game on the road, the game down in Tampa, which you've, you're watching a little bit of film of here. This is going to be a pl play where Evans beats him. The throw appears to be a little bit late. He recovers. And then also the home game against Atlanta. I thought those were the three games where he played with the least amount of efficiency and the least amount of effectiveness. You can see that Evans has him beat. Ball's thrown a little bit behind where he, where he um, you know, is looking for it. But I'll tell you where, you know, Marlon Humphrey shined. Again, the Bills game at home and the three games against the Bengals this year. It's a high standard to have to play three games against uh, Cincinnati with, with those receivers and how talented they are. I think, I think T. Higgins got him on a, a sideline comeback. Maybe that was week 18, but that, that may have been, to be honest with you, that may have been a playoff game on the left sideline. I think it was a, a second and seven. But other than that, those guys didn't really do much against Marlon. When I say those guys, I mean Higgins and Chase. Certainly, Boyd didn't do much against him. I'm going to show you a play here in a moment of him, what he did to Boyd a couple of times. So let's talk about zone, because I basically just showed you a lot of man stuff. Now, zone, when I say that, I'm going to, I'm going to include our read coverages, okay? I think this one is an example of two read. And it's a great break. Now, it ends up being a first down for Miami. Don't get me wrong. But it's a great break on the ball. I call it two read, but Marcus Williams certainly isn't reading anything other than the quarterback. So when I say two read, what I mean is the corner and the safety both reading two. And if if two goes vertical, let's say you know one sits this thing down, then Marlon's going to stay with the number one, 
and the safety would take two vertical. But the, the benefit of two reader, one of the things they're trying to do is one of the reasons why they play it against detached twins, meaning two receivers outside of the, the tackle lined up at a, a, a normal split is for that out by the number two and then the vertical by number one. It would allow the, the safety to go ahead and play the vert by one, and then basically it allows the corner to go ahead and jump that out, basically trying to, to steal an interception. You see Tua's let, pulling a pin on the gray net, gr grenade now, getting ready to let go of the football. Marcus Williams' eyes have been on pretty much the quarterback the whole time, but the angle that we have from the All-22, you know, we don't know what his eyes did. He may have seen two go out. Arlen breaks on it. So he's, he's good in the read coverages. Here's going to be another example, I think, in a moment. This is what I call the Ravens' funnel coverage. And they play it, oftentimes they play it versus stacked twins. I'll let you see it a couple of times. Now, some people would just say, hey, coach, that's just two man. Yeah, but I think there's an element to this in terms of Marlon staying inside leverage on number two. And then look down here. I think this is Brandon Stevens staying inside leverage on number two or who, whoever breaks on the inside. The corner staying outside leverage. This guy doesn't, that's up there. That might be Brandon Stevens up there. I may have been mistaken. And then the safety's playing over the top. Essentially, that we're trying to wall off the middle of the field and funnel everyone into this area here, into this safety. Again, funnel these two guys into the safety. That's why I call it funnel coverage. Uh, it is two read, basically. Don't get me wrong. Excuse me. It is two man. I'm sorry. I misspoke. It is two man, but there's an element to it in terms of the leverage that we're maintaining. I'm, what I'm trying to do is show you all of the different coverages that Morgan played at a high level, in my opinion. It's an example of two read. Here, him and Marcus Peters are a little bit unsure about how to play it, but I, I think you could also qualify this as our funnel coverage, all right, in terms of there's number two running a vertical into the safety. Marlon is on the inside leverage. There's number two checking his route up, and there's Kyle Hamilton on the inside leverage. And both corners, in this case, uh, Brandon Stevens up top and Marcus Peters down the bottom are outside leverage. So I, I misspoke a moment ago. I think you would just call this our funnel coverage, not to read. And him and Marcus Peters, I didn't think Peters – preferred our read coverage is I think Peters would prefer to just you know play man or play zone and to read can be considered a, a match man in some ways uh, some ways it can be considered an off man I mean it looks depending on the route configuration and how the routes work themselves out it can look like man or it can look like zone hopefully that makes sense but in any case I thought Marlon was effective at this all year this was one of the few times where it didn't look like him and the corner, the outside corner, were on the same page. And I didn't think Marcus Peters was super comfortable in our read coverages anyway. All right, down here at the bottom, I think you got a version of two here. He's pushing number one in to the safety. You got two high safety look with Marcus Williams. I think that's Chuck Clark. Marlon is asked to do a ton in terms of execute certain responsibilities. It very much to me resembles the funnel, except for this is an inside linebacker. And you can see that they're not back to the quarterback. They haven't turned away from the quarterback. This is clearly a cover two zone where you got eyes on the quarterback. Roquan Smith's eyes aren't, but Marlon's keeping his eyes on the quarterback while he's pushing number one in. Just your classic cover two. Ravens actually played a lot of cover two this year against the, um, against the Bengals. Marlon's up top here, by the way, against Chase. Right there. I'm calling this zone, even though Marlon doesn't appear to be playing zone. I would say that this is just a lock call backside, meaning you got two guys in the backfield. Everybody knows in that Joker set, the Bengals are throwing the football. I think the Ravens are playing zone to this side because you got two receivers. And then I think they've just allowed Marlon to play man there, give him a little bit of help to that side. Some people would say this is quarter, quarter, half man. Because Marlon would be, you know, quarter, quarter, half, and the half defender is typically deeper, which in this case is Chuck Clark. But they just made a man call on the backside to turn that quarter into man, kind of free Marcus Williams up to read the quarterback. Down here, got Chase, and I think, uh, is that Boyd to his side? But clearly looks like his own. Cover three. Four under drops. Deep third. Deep third, and then your middle of the field safety looks like Chuck Clark. We're spinning. We're spinning Marcus Williams down here, 
to get underneath of this route by Jamar Chase. And Marlon is involved in all of these coverages. He's generally in the right place at the right time, depending on the route that's run. Very rarely have you seen him in 2022 blow a coverage. I will talk about one particular type of route that he did have issues with in 2022 and that we have had issues with for years, whether it was Wink Martindale, whether it was um, Mike McDonald as the DC. You know, we've had trouble with over Yankee concepts for years. This is a Tampa 2 version that we're playing. So you got half field safety, half field safety, corner, which is Peters, which is in the flat, Marlin, which is a corner in the flat. And we're just trying to prevent the Bengals from making big plays. In the, and we did that. I think Marlon Humphrey, Humphrey was a big part of preventing that team from making big plays. Up here to the top side, he's got T. Higgins. I think this is going to be a, a great effort play by Daryl Worley. Good read by uh, Marlon Humphrey. I would call this invert cover two. So at the snap, Marcus Williams is going to kind of step down, flat foot read. Chuck's going to kind of step down, flat foot read. Marlon and Worley are kind of getting off here. You'll see where it looks like Marcus Williams is beat. I think they catch, they caught us in invert cover two. I believe the Ravens were looking for something like this to develop to one side or the other, and then allowing this safety to play. I'm just not sure I'm a big fan of it when you got Jamar Chase matched up against Daryl Worley down here. But in any case, what I'm, what I'm talking about with Marlon is T. Higgins' route brings him into the inside, all right? It's a great effort play by Worley, which is – the main aspect of this play. But what I'm talking about is Marlon's hustle and effort. When the ball gets tipped by Daryl Worley, this very easily could have been a 14-point swing. Well, maybe a, at least a seven-point swing. Could have been a touchdown to Chase. Worley and Marcus Williams, great effort. Ball's up in the air. I mean, Marlon's effort, his willingness to run once the ball was thrown from the 32, 33, all the way down into the end zone, even though he's way away from he's out of the play, he's not going to stop that. I think it's significant. I think it says a lot about where his brain was this year and what his motivation was. You know, the title, like I said, Pure Blood is a reference to his his family history, you know, his athletic history. I think you got a version of quarters here. And Marwin reads it perfectly. He lets one go in. He lets one go in to the safety, and you'll see he will even point to Marcus Williams, and then he looks for help on, he looks to help on two, who's going out. You can see Marlon pointing to Marcus Williams now, telling him to go ahead and take him, and he's going to match up with two, which I think is a tight end run out to the flats. Burrow kind of extends it. Bowser almost got a sack there, by the way. Burrow pays for it, gets another big hit, throws the ball out of bounds. You can see the, the multitude of coverages that he played this year, the, the various locations that he played. I'm going to show you in a minute his physicality. Even in the past, I know the, the modern game doesn't allow people to be physical. When you are asked to do this many different techniques, and that's part of Mike McDonald's defense, and you execute them all at a high level, you are the reliable piece. In my opinion, Marlon Humphrey is a field side corner in most systems before the NFL. What I, what I mean by that is he's the guy who plays to the field and plays a multitude of coverages because you can trust him. You can trust him to be in the right place. Some guys are a boundary side corner because it's going to be a little bit more simplified coverage, maybe just man. I love this play because the Ravens aren't playing, aren't seeing this route a ton this year. You got the running back out into the flat sale concept, I think, basically. And then you got the number one receiver, I think, on a clear out. So Marlon is basically being high load by the running back going out in the flats and then the deeper out concept, sale, whatever you want to call it. Roquan takes the flat. Marlon matches up with the deep out. Roquan ends up getting credit for a sack because Marlon's in great coverage relationship. You can see that that is the uh, point of attack, or that's where the Panthers wanted to go with that football. Very versatile. I love everything that he did this year. I think if you were to ask me, is he top 10? Is he top 5? I don't know. I, I just don't know. I just know he wasn't targeted a lot. There has to be a reason for that. I don't think it's random. When he's not targeted, it's not like we're keeping him away from certain receivers. In some cases, he traveled with certain receivers. This is a ball that I think Burrow and Higgins would not like to have back. Certainly is an opportunity to get him the football. I don't think Marlon is there to stop this ball at all. For whatever reason, Burrow throws it a little bit further upfield. Higgins is bringing his route you know, back down towards the sideline. Higgins did beat Lamar on that route. Excuse me. Higgins did beat Marlon on that route 
I would say, I think it was week 18. We're back to the beginning here. Let me show you some physicality, please. This is designed to be, this is designed to be, to be honest with you, comprehensive and show you guys, you know, the entirety of a player season or, you know, as best I can. I'm not going to show, you know, 300 plays. I think here we got 62. I'm trying to move through them kind of quick. He's physical. I think Marlon is willing to get penalties at times. And this first play that I'm going to show you, I think, is an example. Of that. And, and here's what I mean by that. I think he's willing to make contact and be physical with receivers all across the field, the width of the field, the depth of the field at certain times, and recognizes that, hey, I might get a penalty on this, but there's a cumulative effect sometimes of being physical. That's why I love zone in some cases, because you can have leverage on a receiver and push him into someone else's zone. Yeah, this becomes contact downfield. I like it because what it's doing, what it can do, maybe not in every case, depends on who the receiver and the personality is, of the you know the guy you're playing against. But what it tells him is, hey, when you come through my zone or my area, I'm going to make contact with you. And the next time that receiver comes through there, he may, he may have to go another yard further in this direction to run his route. You essentially become a chess piece, forcing the player to go around you and into another player's zone, impacting the route. The route may not be drawn up on paper by the coach to bend it around a defender in certain cases. I think Marlon is a physical guy against the run. I think he's physical in man and zone against the pass. I know it's an innocuous play. Well, he drew. he's not innocuous. He drew, he drew a five-yard penalty. But it's not a one-time thing, guys. He does this all the time, particularly in zone. He redirects people, sets a tone with them. This is backside. Boyd doesn't even get into the route. It's a third and eight. You know, do I think they were going to target Boyd there anyway? No. As the backside receiver against a Tampa two, to this point, this is early in the game, the Bengals didn't understand yet that the Ravens were lining up in all kinds of stuff. And all we were doing was dropping into a Tampa two. I don't know if you guys can see Chuck over there, but we are dropping into a Tampa 2. I think you've got Patrick Queen who's going to drop to the the the, um, the middle of the field, uh, running the pipe, which is what some people call it. And Marlon backside's probably not going to be targeted. Maybe he knows that. But it's the physical tone that he sets. I think there's something to be said for that. Up top against Jacksonville. Run this little two-man screen. Now, there's first contact by Brandon Stevens, who I'm going to do a film study on also. I don't know if it's going to be as lengthy as this one. But I love that when Marlon Humphrey doesn't want to be blocked by a receiver, he's not going to be. If the play's away from him, he may allow himself to be blocked if it's 30 yards away from him. But when, when he's at the point of attack, when he is where the ball is being targeted, number one, he's not going to let himself be blocked by a receiver. In some cases, he's not going to let himself be blocked by a tight end. Number two, watch his helmet. He, he has fantastic eyes, man. He sees things. He just looked at the receiver, looked back at the quarterback, glanced, I don't know if you guys saw it, at the blocker, back at the quarterback, sees the ball thrown, and now goes. He has elite recognition pre-snap and during the play. I love his ability to play physical. This is a run concept to his side. Him, Marcus Williams, Patrick Queen does a great job, if you ask me, stretching this thing out some. You guys let me know if you're as impressed by his physicality. Uh, one of the guys in my Discord, um, Stacey Van Diver, was talking about how, you know, Marlon played linebacker in high school and then transitioned to defensive back at Alabama. I can see it. I can see, you know, hallmarks of a guy who is willing to come downhill and make tackles and make plays, and he's, he does so in the NFL. Down here at the bottom side, look, every time he's trying to be physical, it's not, um, it's not successful. I'm going to say this about Marlon. Taysom Hill just runs him over. I think if the same thing happens on the very next play, I think Marlon attacks it with the same level of tenacity, the same level of effort. Now, he might fit it a little bit further on the outside. He might fit it a little bit lower next time. He may get run over the next time. If it happens a third play in a row, I think Marlon Humphrey's the kind of guy that's going to go ahead and, and, and bring it again. I love his effort. I think he had a fantastic year. Yeah, I was one of those people saying – you know, around about week four, week five, saying, hey, people are avoiding him. Did I have did I have data to show that? No, I wish I had the ability to track targets and track plays in, in, that, in that manner and be able to tell, oh, they targeted this guy seven times. That's difficult to do with all the other formation and data stuff that I try to do at least. Point of this is he played fantastic coverage. He played fantastic coverage 
almost the entire season, absent, I'd say, three games. And he did it while being asked to execute multiple techniques and schemes, which I think I've shown you here. The routes that he has struggled with, that'll be the last thing that I show you before we close this up, is over concepts or Yankee. So here he is up top. I think it's born that he's going against here. I might be wrong. This might not be born. Teams have attacked. This is man. Okay, so he's just getting beat here on the, on the over concept. Sometimes against zone, we get beat on this because we don't communicate. We don't play it well. Now, in my opinion, you, you've got secondary issues here whereby we're dropping Owe out of here. Not blaming Owe for the completion. This guy is running you know, this route here. Watch the depth that Owe gets. Owe's not used to taking pass drops like Chuck Clark is, like Kyle Hamilton is. Look at the depth that these two have. All right now, it's a third and four. Look at the depth that Owe has. He's not used to doing that. How much time does he spend doing pa pass drops in practice? He spends some because we play this coverage, and we all recognize that it's frustrating as hell to watch us play this coverage with Owe. But if his feet are here, we're in better position to defend this route. It's not blaming Odafe Owe. It's just saying the first wall or, or second level of the defense, the linebacker level, needs to be consistent. Hamilton and Clark and Owe should be in a line there helping Marlon out. Now, Marlon just got beat. Same route here against the Jets. I don't think he's targeted on the initial um, cut here. I think this is Wilson, who the Jets did not do a good job of getting the ball to early in this game. I thought they found out at some point that how difficult it was for people to match up with Garrett Wilson, tremendous athlete, thankfully for the Ravens. In the slot here, same route concept, beat again. Does it mean that he gets beat on this route all the time? No. But in the slot against that route, he has demonstrated the that he gets beat sometimes. You know, is it 12 times this season? Is it 15 times? I don't know how many times it is, but I'm showing you four of them. In the slot again against Diggs, who I think is open here. Diggs didn't have a great game against us. For whatever reason, the ball was coming out on the backside. Josh Bynes gets a pass, pass breakup. But you guys can see enough here that if there's if there's – Anything to identify that he struggles with or that you can attack Marlon Humphrey with is over concepts when we're in man, third down, like you just saw. Part and parcel to that is, you know, again, our help here is a little short depth-wise, but that's the yard to go right there. So you don't need binds back, you know, back here at all. Well, point is when we do have second level defenders to try to throw the ball over the top of, I can't really draw an arrow going over the top of, so forgive the sloppy drawing there, it helps out those guys who are in coverage. But this is man, so you're not going to have underneath droppers and man. You only get, to, while you're in man, you only get to play defense with, you know, 11 guys down here on the bottom. This is more so what the Ravens have struggled with in terms of the over concept, is, is what I call Yankee, and some other people have different names. You get to vertical. For those of you that have watched the channel for a while or watch Ravens, um, you know, games consistently every year, if you remember, this is what Jefferson had a touchdown on the Ravens early in the Vikings' loss to the Ravens in week, I think, 9, 2021. Marlon and Chuck Clark were unable to communicate about how they were going to sift it out, and you can kind of see a little bit of an example of it here. So Marlon covering this route, even though it's a little bit deeper concept, this is Dolchich, all right, running the route across here. It's a little bit deeper concept than the three that I previously showed you. Covering that route in man, he had some trouble. Let's draw it up the way that, you know, truly mean it. You know, in man, like the previous three plays I showed you, that route there. This one's a little bit deeper, all right? But we also have trouble matching up with the clear out, which is this route down here by Sutton, who's a really talented player. I would love to see the Ravens look at picking him up if he's cut or traded. We have trouble covering this one. So the over concept, I mean, it's just a great concept. You get a clear out route from one side, whether it's man or zone, gives the guy opportunity. In this case, it's a deep over concept. Look, I hope you guys enjoy this. I tried to show you Multiple examples of what Marlon did well this year and the, all the different coverages. Two read, quarters, man, cover two zone, Tampa two, cover three. You know, asked to execute, I'd say, at least eight coverages in the span of just one game. Each game, he was asked to execute a, all of those coverages or, or, you know, a lot of them. In the, in the first Bengals game, week five, we just played a lot of Tampa two. I think if you really want to know if Marlon Humphrey played well, you, you have – evidence of it and what A.J. Brown said this week in his interview. When they asked him who's the best corner he played 
And I don't think he said Marlon's the best, but he just said he's annoying because he's there in the middle of the route. That was such a neat way to describe it. Some guys are are not there in the middle of the route. They're they're beat, but they can recover. Or they're on the top side of the route, so they're not annoying you. Marlon's kind of like there all the time. Smart, athletic, physical, brilliant playmaker. Now, didn't see much of that in 2021. I do think there was one or two opportunities this year to get interceptions that he didn't take advantage of. I still think he's a brilliant playmaker. Look, and he just did not live up to that standard in 2021. You you just have to call it the way it is. I think this year was important for him. It was important to defend Jamar Chase and the Bengals better, and we did. It was important for him to um, to not give up big plays, and generally I don't think he did. George Pickens made a great play down the left sideline against him. Mike Evans had those two big catches you know, vertically downfield, like I said. And I thought Drake London made an unbelievable catch on a third down against him. I thought Drake London had two other catches, intermediate routes. Those bigger receivers gave him issues at times. I would say that and the over concepts is a relative weakness for his. What's a relative weakness? Well, you say relative weakness when someone has a whole hell of a lot of strengths in this one particular area or maybe two are weaker than the other six or eight or ten parts or elements to their game. It's like Madden ratings. I don't know how many how many different rating scales there are in Madden. I'll just say there's 10. And somebody has eight really good ones, eight of them that are 88 or above. And then two of them, they've got you know a 74 and a 77. It's a relative weakness. It doesn't mean it's an absolute weakness. Uh, he comes from a football family. Like I said, he grew up in, um, I think he grew up right there in Hoover or in the city or the town and and didn't run from expectation. I think that's the first clue that could be looked at as the first clue that he was going to have a bounce back season in 2022 because he didn't run from expectation. He went to Hoover High and then attended Alabama, which like I said earlier, that's where his dad Bobby Humphrey went. His dad didn't just go there. His dad's a legend to Alabama. Made the Pro Bowl in the NFL, I think once. Mom, you know, was a track athlete I think at Alabama. His brother played I think at UAB. So Tremendous lineage, you know, in terms of athletes in his family. He lived up to that in college. And he's shown us once again in 2022 that that last season, 2021, was the anomaly. This is who he is. 2022 is who he is. Will he ever force eight fumbles again, score two defensive touchdowns, uh, cause another defensive touchdown, the forced fumble that LJ Fort picked up and took to the house? I don't know. It, it would be difficult to say yes to that just because – they seem to be such anomalies across the NFL in, in terms of defensive touchdowns. For Marlon Humphrey, he puts himself in position, I think, on every play to defend, compete, and, and put his defense, put his guys in an opportunity to win. I love his game. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I was one of the first people, I hate even saying that, but one of the people early in the season saying, Marlon Humphrey's playing great. They're avoiding him. You know, no one's throwing at him. And then we get to later on in the season, and you have three games where people did kind of attack him a little more with some success. So I was actually glad to see that because the standards that he has for himself, I think it's going to give him something else to work on. It's going to give him something else to identify, to say I've got to get better in that area and that area and that area. And I think he will. I think Marlon Humphrey puts together another four or five seasons at the level that we're seeing him play against, and he's a guy that obviously gets in a ring of honor for the Ravens. And he starts to become a guy that you can talk about maybe being on the Hall of Fame because he's that freaking good. And like I said earlier, is he a top 10, top 5 in the league right now? I think it's very difficult to discern who's top 5, who's top 10, top 15 at certain positions in the NFL. And I would say corner is one of them. A, because there's so many good guys. There's so many great players. I should say great, not good. And B, because they are asked to do vastly different things. Think of Seattle when they won the Super Bowl. Their corners played a lot of cover three. So they were playing a larger percentage of the game in the same technique. You've seen from the film I showed you, if you trust the coverage that I say that we're playing on each particular play I showed you, Marlon is asked to do a lot of different things, and he does them all well. I think he's committed, uh, and he has to play at this high of a level because of the, the salary structure that the Ravens have, what the Ravens are paying him. And I think he recognizes that. Man, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. This was meant to be about a 40-minute video, so I'm not sure where we're coming in at. 
It was fun for me to look at Marlon Humphrey film. This one took me about five days to get to, to get completed with. I really wanted to bring a comprehensive look at the way he played this year and show as many different techniques as possible that he was asked to do. And I think he did at an elite, elite level. Thank you guys for your time. If you think that um, people, other people would enjoy this video, please consider sharing a link on social media. Uh, thank you guys for your time.